Your Excellency, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, and the many friends of the Indonesia Project. Welcome to this evening's celebration of 50 successful years of the Indonesia Project here at the Australian National University. I'm Veronica Taylor. I have the privilege of being the Dean of the ANU College of Asia and the Pacific. And this is the college uh, which is very proud to be the home of the Indonesia Project. Before we start the formal proceedings this evening, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet, the Ngunnawal people, and pay our respects to their elders past and present. We're here this evening to celebrate the Indonesia Project. Success has many fathers and mothers, and all of them wish to speak tonight. <laughs> and uh, what I'm sure will be uh, the first of many uh, warm addresses, I invite to the podium uh, the uh, Vice-Chancellor of the ANU, Professor Ian Young. I'd like to thank you uh, very much, so distinguished guests, uh, members of the Indonesian community, colleagues and friends. It's really a great pleasure to be here with you this evening to celebrate uh, 50th anniversary of the ANU Indonesian project. <coughs> it's a particular pleasure to welcome so many people back to the university, number here in the, in the front row, but really throughout the, the whole audience. So, uh, welcome. Uh, you are uh, enormously welcome here, as you've been over many, many years. The ANU Indonesian project has resulted, importantly, in this university being widely recognised as the leading international centre outside of Indonesia for research and graduate training in countries, economy, politics and society. The project influences many things, but particularly the creation of stronger research-based public policy in Indonesia, especially in areas such as economic development, human capital, regional development, poverty, governance, environmental environment and social development, and it does this by producing and disseminating world-class quality research, by conducting public dialogues, by building institutional capacity, and by establishing institution networks. And all those are, are tremendously important to what it does. As you're undoubtedly aware, this event marks the 50th anniversary of the establishment of the project, and over 50 years of commitment to Indonesian studies by the Australian National University. I was joking to some of my colleagues earlier that there are very few institutions today that actually survive 50 years. I think if you look across our society today, that's really quite unusual. And I did joke that clearly there's a whole generation of deans and vice chancellors that have not been trying hard enough. Uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, in your organisation like this, the structure seems to be common. But the fact that this very, very important institution to survive, I think, goes to the core of just why it is so important, not just this institution, but I think to so many things that are important both in this country uh, and in Indonesia. The event also marks over 35 years of continued support for the project from the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Peter and your colleagues and your previous uh, uh, incarnations, we would thank you very much for that continued and sustained support. This would not be possible without that support. The project was established in 1965, really by the vision of Professor Heinz Arndt, uh, in response to profound changes in the Indonesian economy and the political landscape. Initially, it comprised a small group of Indonesian-focused economists uh, and since then it has really grown into uh, an interdisciplinary research centre. Uh, researching the economic development of Indonesia is still at its heart. However, now the project brings together academics, students, policy makers uh, and leaders from a range of disciplines and countries to discuss the multitude of, of issues facing contemporary Indonesia. And they are indeed many uh, complex. The Bulletin of Indonesian Economic Studies the Indonesia Update Conference, research grants, high-level policy dialogues, and public seminars are amongst the many uh, activities that the Indonesia Project now conducts, both 
here in Australia uh, and importantly also in Indonesia. The project has helped to build, I think, uh, I'm sure this is the case, a much greater understanding between Indonesia and Australia and it's fostered uh, important relations between uh, our countries and indeed uh, between our scholars, our students and our policy makers. And I think as well as the, the very important policy issues, uh, it really does foster that people-to-people -people interaction. And I see, you see that uh, here this evening in many, many ways. So look, on behalf of the ANU and the ANU community, uh, I'd like to congratulate the Indonesia project on reaching this really important uh, and significant milestone in its history. And, and we very much look forward to uh, the strong leadership that it will be able to continue to, uh, uh, to bring forward in the future and or perhaps the next 50 years. <coughs> Thank you all very much.
as I can, I guess, testify better than most, having followed for the last 30 years or more, particularly as Foreign Minister and then as head of the International Crisis Group, just about every twist and turn in Indonesia's political evolution. We've had the high of, a number of highs, the high of Paul Keating's relationship with mm. President Sanato, culminating in the security agreement of 1995. I can never resist quoting in this context Rob Whitlam's famous remark, Paul has always preferred older men. There was the high, there was the undoubted high of my own relationship, wonderful relationship with Aliantas. Manifested, I guess, the Cambodian <coughs> Peace Plan, the establishment of APEC, the ASEAN Regional Forum, a number of issues on which we work very closely together. More recently, we've had the obvious mutual regard of SB1 and John Howard, Martin Naplego and Julie Bishop, and very good cooperation on issues like disaster relief and counter-terrorism. But we've also had, as we all know, recurring lows over East Timor, the media criticism of Indonesian leaders, most famously, I guess, Yes, the David Jenkins articles on President Sahato and his family just before I became foreign minister. Uh, Papua, uh, illegal fishing, cattle exports, spying, and of course, asylum seeker Boat Tobex and the Bali 2 executions. But through all this storm and drum, the Indonesia project has just ploughed on, periodically renewing itself or adjusting direction but steadily acquiring an ever more stellar reputation. To the point where the Bullet of Indonesian Economic Studies has long been regarded as the world's premier journal focusing on the Indonesian economy, and the annual Indonesian updates, as Ian Young has already said, have long been the best attended and most highly valued international conferences on general Indonesian affairs held anywhere outside Indonesia. And as Colin Brown knows, probably inside the country too. Part of the reason for the success of the project um, has been its orientation, though it's developed over time, a slightly wider disciplinary outlook with members and associates, including political scientists, demographers, historians, geographers. Its focus has, of course, always been preeminently economic, and I guess this has helped insulate it from some of the stormier political winds that have blown over the last 50 years. But the reasons for the project's success really go deeper than that. And three factors in particular emerge, I think, from Colin Brown's book, and indeed my own observation of the project over many years. And the first is the quality of the project leadership. Heinzart's political conservatism and steadfast defence of some of the unhappier behaviour of the new order, including its record in East Timor, meant that he was not entirely without critics during his tenure. But he deserved and he won nothing but praise. For his initial vision, establishing the project, his entrepreneurship, his mentoring of successive generations of students, researchers, and the rigorous standards that he set. And when Heinzart retired in 1980, the leadership passed seamlessly to a succession of first rate scholars, all of them here tonight Peter McCauley, Al Hill, Chris Manning, and now Udi Rizasadama. Udi, the first Indonesian head of the project, and the first who actually was not a former student of Heinzart's. <laughs> the, uh, the, second, the second factor underlying the project's success, I think it's fair to say, is the, is the quality of the institutional support that, it's already, that it has received. Now, that support has been pretty consistent from the Australian government, although not with a few swerves along the way following changes of government and minister. I'm glad to see that in the book, uh, Bill Haynes and my periods as foreign minister are recorded as positive swerves in that respect. <laughs> I, for one, still have the scars to prove it from my fights under aid and research budgets with the late Peter Walsh and the Huns and Visigoths of the Finance Department. <laughs> uh, what's been totally consistent and as rock solid as anything can be, I guess, in the university environment, is I'm glad to say, glad to say that support the project has received from the ANU and its successive vice chancellors, even on occasion from chancellors. And we, we do have our uses over the last five decades. And rightly so, because the project has been a jewel in the ANU crown throughout its history, with both the rigour and the policy relevance of its research exemplifying so much of the national and the international role and reputation to which we aspire. I think the third crucial factor, the remaining on my list, is the, in the Indonesia project's success, is very well described by Colin Brown, and it's been at its heart 
not so much as an institution as a network of people. I've actually always had my reservations about networking, particularly self-conscious networking events. <laughs> as, um, as George Soros once said to me, networking, as far as he was concerned, meant not working. <laughs> but I'm prepared to concede, prepared to concede, as Colin says about the project, the key to its longevity is the web of connections its members have created in Australia, in Indonesia, and increasingly globally. Most importantly of all, in this respect, the project has, has very consciously drawn in Indonesians to be at the core of its work. Not just by operating as one Indonesian postgraduate student of the project wonderfully described it, a production centre for Indonesian public intellectuals, but also, of course, as a continuing vehicle for ongoing research and policy exchange. And not only in Australia, but ever increasingly in Indonesia itself, with multiple activities there, ranging from the Jakarta Seminar Series, or FKF, FKP run, uh, involving primarily academics and researchers, to the high-level policy dialogues, dialogues attended by senior Jakarta and Canberra economic and financial policy makers. All of these things undertaken in collaboration with Indonesian counterparts. It's become, I guess, something of a cliche to describe the Australia-Indonesia relationship as requiring, if it's to survive the ups and downs of its political dimension, above all else, more balanced. I should know about that cliche because I think it was me with Ali Alatas who first used the term in this context. But of course the region, the reason that cliches get to be cliches is usually because they embody some obvious and fundamental truths. And there is no more obvious truth than that people-to-people -people relationships are the bedrock on which fundamentally stable and productive bilateral relationships are based. So the Indonesian project with its incredibly strong and professional to professional people-to-people -people dimension, sustained now over so many decades, is a quintessential example of the kind of ballast our bilateral relationship continues to need. May it long survive, may it long thrive. Great achievements, final words, if they are to be recognised, above all to be remembered, need great record keepers, great historians. And we can all be immensely grateful to Colin Brown. Where is he? Here he is, Colin, he should be up here on the stage. We can all be immensely grateful that Colin Brown, though not himself an ANU man, has taken on the role of guardian of the flame for what we at ANU regard as one of the proudest of all of our achievements. He's done the job admirably. This book, Australia's Indonesia Project, 50 Years of Engagement, is a meticulously researched history using archival sources, of course, interviews as well, and an abundance of secondary material. And it's about as comprehensive and as enlightening as one could possibly wish. So, I'm delighted to have this very memorable occasion to thank everyone associated with this publication, this production, and to declare that it's duly launched. <laughs>
distinguished mothers and fathers of success that we're celebrating here. <coughs> Can I particularly to our distinguished Indonesian visitors, to former Vice President Budiona, to Ibu Mari, to former Vice Minister and former Finance Minister Basri, and of course, my good friend Kambesta Naju, uh, extend a very warm welcome to them. Uh, for 50 years now, the Indonesia project has fostered a deep understanding of Indonesia within that regrettably still too narrow Australian constituency which takes a serious interest in Indonesia. The project has played a, an important role in giving us a framework for thinking about Indonesia, why it matters to Australia and how it's changing. For Australian policymakers, the project has been a reference point in the journey of Indonesian policy, which has itself been full of challenges and complexities. That's why DFAT has been a proud supporter of the project's work beginning as long ago as 1980 and currently amounting to over a million dollars a year. But for all the good work done by the Indonesia project and others, the truth is Australia and Indonesia still face an immense gap in community awareness and understanding. When he addressed the Australian Parliament in 2010, former President Yudhiyono said, and I quote, in Indonesia, there are people who remain afflicted with Australia phobia. Those who believe that the notion of white Australia still persists that Australia harbours ill intention towards Indonesia and is either sympathetic to or supports separate settlements in our country." End of quote. That view, as SBY made clear then, was of course woefully out of date. But five years on, these outmoded perceptions remain. Likewise, the broad Australian understanding of Indonesia is regrettably poor. According to the recent Lowy poll's feelings thermometer, Australians feel as warm towards Indonesia as they do to Russia, <laughs> and well below Malaysia and China, and only 34% regard Indonesia as a democracy. This is the case, notwithstanding the success of Indonesia's democracy, one of the seminal developments of the past two decades and the widely experienced warmth of the Indonesian people. The last 50 years have seen profound changes in Indonesia, not just the transition to democracy, but also far-reaching decentralization, the growth of a strong civil society, economic development, and a culture of political debate underpinned by a robust media, including a penetration of social media that has made Jakarta the Twitter capital of the world. Tonight, I'd like to sketch out the significance of Indonesia to Australia, and in particular, the importance of Indonesia's continued economic success, which we hope will be to hold to the path of ever greater openness and integration into the region. Indonesia is a nation of first-order strategic significance to Australia. It's the world's largest archipelagic state, located at the fulcrum of the Indian and Pacific Oceans and straddling the world's most important sea lanes, like Australia and Indo-Pacific nation. Around 50% of global shipping trade and tonnage and around 70% of Australian merchandise trade by value passes through Indonesian waters each year. Its economy, currently the 16th largest, is projected to be the fourth largest by 2050 and will eclipse Australia's in nominal terms by 2030. In purchasing power parity terms, it is of course already bigger than the Australian economy. Indonesia has a young population with around 45% under 25 years of age and its demographics are changing rapidly. Indonesia's consumer class, currently at around 50 million, is expected to grow to as many as 135 million by 2030. Indonesia's size, geographic location, and growing economic weight, making up more than a third of ASEAN's GDP, 
make it the region's center of economic gravity. It's an important member of the G20 and the East Asia Summit and has played a key leadership role within ASEAN since its inception in 1967. Indonesia is the natural leader of ASEAN and the direction of its strategic policy and the strength of its economy will have a large influence on ASEAN's standing. An Indonesia that is stable, prosperous and democratic, capable of addressing its political, security and economic challenges, and able to contribute positively to regional stability and economic growth is firmly in Australia's interests. As its economic weight grows, the potential for Indonesia to exercise greater strategic heft may also increase, although this could be a much longer term project given the pre predominantly domestic focus of Indonesia's military and its low defence spending under 1% of GDP. Despite recent slower growth, Indonesia's fundamentally positive growth trajectory offers important opportunities for the Indonesian people and also for Australia and our neighbourhood. For all the bumps in the relationship, it's worth reminding ourselves that since the end of the New Order period, our two countries have come a long way together. Today, we have an extensive web of officials level engagement with, by DFAT's calculation, over 20 federal agencies cooperating with Indonesian counterparts in more than 60 discrete activities. We have made real progress in building the partnership at a government to government level, particularly since 1998. Since the Bali bombings in 2001, We've built extensive, 2002 I should say, we've built extensive and effective cooperation in counter-terrorism and law enforcement. In 2010, we elevated our relationship to a strategic partnership and buttressed it with stronger bilateral architecture, including annual leaders meetings. Australia is the only Asia-Pacific country to have a foreign and defence ministers two plus two meeting with Indonesia. And Indonesia is one of only five countries with which, with which Australia has a two plus two meeting. But yet, as we have seen over many decades, the relationship sometimes struggles to remain on an even keel. The reality of the Australia-Indonesia relationship is that despite the efforts we have made in government on both sides, we have not yet built the broader constituencies that would give the relationship genuine resilience. Outside of academic and government circles, we have yet to see that network of relationships across government, business and the community that give a relationship the ballast to which Gareth refers that it needs to cope with momentary political crises or differences in policy. There are many reasons for this. Our structural links are not deeply embedded. We come from different historical and cultural backgrounds which means the points of congruence in our worldviews are less than they might otherwise be. Our strategic reference points are different, although more recently they have moved much closer together. And importantly, the economic, investment and commercial relationship has not yet achieved its full potential. India is, uh, Indonesia is ranked today only as our 12th largest trading partner. Until now, we have both been largely commodity exporting economies, working somewhat in parallel, often with the same customers. We both look north. Beyond tourism, we have not had a connection in the kind of services trade which is now becoming possible with the growth of the Indonesian consuming class. As the Indonesian expert Jamie Mackey has written, no attempts to improve relations between our two countries will achieve much unless trade, investment and business contacts between us develop much more vigorously. The good news is that the 21st century, as, as the 21st century unfolds, there is more and more scope for us to work together. Provided we resist the siren calls of protectionism and economic nationalism, provided we both remain committed to openness, economic reform and active participation in a competitive global economy, the prospects should be bright for us to work more closely together in many more ways. 
Like Australia, Indonesia has experienced a growing number of its citizens travelling to the Middle East to fight with terrorist organisations. So it is vital that Australia and Indonesia continue to build counter-terrorism cooperation, including to deal with emerging challenges such as foreign fighters and countering violent extremism. Our cooperation since the Bali bombings provides a good platform for facing the challenges we will inevitably face as trained foreign fighters return home. Nearly 95 of the 111 Australians who have died in terrorist attacks since 2001 were in Indonesia. We have a shared interest in defeating the threats posed from violent extremism. We've long had a development partnership, but it's now time to take our relationship to a more strategic and innovative level, recasting our cooperation around an economic partnership between two G20 economies. Foreign Minister Julie Bishop wants to reframe our aid program in this way, to make it a broader, more modern economic partnership centered around how we can work together to drive growth, involve the private sector, and find innovative ways of dealing with development challenges. As Indonesia's middle class grows, there are obvious synergies between our national strengths and Indonesia's emerging needs. Working together, we should be able to tap into ever greater regional and global value chains. Australia can be a major provider of services to Indonesia's emerging middle class. Nowhere is this clearer than in the education sector, and not just in terms of Indonesians coming to Australia to study. We want to see a two-way flow, so we're delighted that Indonesia has responded so enthusiastically to the new Colombo plan. Indonesia has been among the most popular destination for new Colombo plan scholars, with one Three out of 4,600 Australian students choosing to study or work in Indonesia. And let's hope this signals a beginning of the end to the decline in Indonesian studies which we have seen in Australian universities in recent years. Over time, this will also help build greater understanding between future leaders in both our countries. But for the relationship to grow, we both have to remain committed to sound economic reform and remain active regional players. We have much to lose by not staying the course on reform or by turning inwards and adopting protectionist policies grounded in economic nationalism. These are a huge deterrent to investors and undermine long-term economic growth. The Australian government em emphasises economic diplomacy, that is, using all the political, diplomatic aid and other levers at our disposal to strengthen our economic and commercial relationships. On this front, we see great potential in the health, education, infrastructure and maritime sectors. Indonesia has a long history of cooperation with regional and global partners to promote international trade and investment including through the establishment of APEC, the negotiation of the ASEAN-Australia Free Trade Agreement, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, and progress towards the ASEAN Economic Community. This cooperation and the long-term trend across the region towards greater economic integration and openness to foreign trade and investment will help Indonesia's significant economic potential as ASEAN as ASEAN launches its economic community in December of this year, Indonesia's role as a regional leader will again be highlighted. When I look forward to the next 50 years, what I hope to see are two neighbours brought far closer to each other, particularly by a much stronger economic relationship. Not just at the government level, analytical or policy making level, but across the breadth of our two societies. What Australia wants for Indonesia is what Indonesians themselves wish for their country. A stable, prosperous and democratic Indonesia capable of addressing its political, security and economic challenges and able to contribute positively to regional stability and economic growth. Over the next 50 years, I'd like to encourage the Indonesia project to take on an even more active role 
to realize the benefits and significance of the bilateral relationship. There is huge scope for you to help other parts of our community outside of government and academia to recognize the potential in the Indonesian relationship. You have an important role to play in helping to make the case against the dangers of economic nationalism wherever it arises. Depth and resilience will come from greater business engagement, from much greater respect, and a better community understanding of our two. For Australia, a productive partnership with Indonesia is a clear national interest. We see Indonesia as a neighbour, a key regional state, and a multilateral partner. It's an important relationship in its own right, but Indonesia also has a big role to play in Australia's broader Indo-Pacific agenda. So much of that agenda turns on an Australia-Indonesia relationship which is close, multi-layered, and anchored in mutual interests. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Peter. We're delighted that uh, you are looking forward to another 50 years for the Indonesian project. We take that as a strong endorsement, <laughs> and uh, we, we share that aspiration with you very strongly indeed. We'll welcome uh, remarks next from His Excellency, uh, Mr. Najib Rifat Kasuma, the Indonesian Ambassador to Australia and Vanuatu. Before becoming the Indonesian Ambassador to Australia and Vanuatu, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, His Excellency was the Deputy Coordinating Minister for Political, Legal and Security Affairs in Indonesia, and earlier in his career had been Minister Counselor of Political Affairs here at the Indonesian Embassy in Canberra. During his time uh, in uh, Australia, His Excellency has been a, a strong and very constructive uh, friend and supporter of both the Indonesian project and also of Indonesian studies here at ANU. Your Excellency. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Veronica Thiel. Yang kami hormati, Bapak Budiono. Honorable uh, Gareth Evans. Uh, His Excellency uh, Peter Farkis, uh, my uh, good friends here, uh, Ibu Mari Pangestu, Bapak Adi Basri, Professor Ayat Yang, Professor Hal Hill, Pak Budi, and uh, also my friends there, Pak Greg Moriarty and Pak Alastair Cox. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening to all of you. I am delighted to again see Pak Budiono, Ibu Mari, and Pak Hatib Basri here in Canberra. For all my academic friends and all the friends of Indonesia, I bid you a very good evening. I have been asked to give a remark tonight on reflecting the 50 years of ANU Indonesia project. I would like to see uh, three points. Uh, the first one, uh, let, let me acknowledge the significant contribution of the Indonesian project to Indonesia's economic development. Always at the forefront of Indonesian studies in Australia and the world since it was established by late Professor Heinz, Heinz Hans in 1965. The Indonesian project has produced many world-class researchers that have advanced Indonesia public policies. A number of prominent Indonesian economists, including Pak Budiono himself, Ibu Mari Pangestu, Bahati Basri, and many more from other disciplines who are involved in projects, have disseminated research findings on economic development, governance, the society, and a range of issues back into Indonesia. Like has been mentioned by my colleague, Ambassador Peter Farkis, that uh, the uh, Indonesian, uh, what Indonesia has achieved of today is also 
the uh, support of the Indonesia project and all the scientists and researchers, academia from ANU for uh, quite a long time. The net effects of which are better public policies that are research based as well as stronger and closer links between researchers and policy makers. It is no co coincidence that in the last 10 years, Indonesia's economy enjoyed one of its st strongest economic growth. This brings me to my second point. The project helped focus the overall Australia-Indonesia relationship and leave it toward a higher stage. This is partly due to Professor Arndt Fischer in the 1960s. He saw the growing importance of the Asia-Pacific region to Australia. <coughs> he then established the Indonesian project, the academic finding of which were influential to foreign policy practitioners in Australia, in Indonesia, and in the world. As an added case, the broad network of researchers, academics, and policy makers linking Australia and Indonesia as the results of the project are one of the most significant ballasts for the bilateral relations. In time of Portugal turbulence, and I'm fortunate to have experienced a few during the past two years, <laughs> those networks <coughs> remain steady and help support the whole bilateral relations. And third, I'm curious of what the next 50 years may have in store of the Indonesia project and how its development will shape Australia-Indonesia relationship. I firmly believe that the future of Australia and Indonesia are closely linked. This is no other option, there is no other option for both countries than to work together in partnership to reach our respective goals. They are too much at stake and it would be too costly if we did not make the partnership work for our countries. I am sure, like also the conviction of uh, uh, my friend uh, Peter Fargeson and also Honorable Kenneth uh, Evans, that our persistency to grow and deepen all aspects of Australia-Indonesia relations would earn us abundant rewards in the near and far future. If I had one, my crystal ball would probably tell me that the Indonesian project will continue doing what it does best. As an excellent creator, as a disseminator and research finding on Indonesia's growth and development, growing together with Australia and a vital institutional network between the two countries. During my previous posting in Canberra in late 90s and early 2000, Professor Hein Anj never failed to participate in Indonesia's Independence Day flag raising ceremony. He would come early to the embassy on August the 17th. 9.30 sharp, usually Heinz already there in the uh, yard of Indonesian embassy, waiting for what's so called the tick the tick proclamasi at the 10 o'clock sharp. Mingle with the ambassador and all staff and observe the solemn ceremony. That small act of courtesy and his many bigger academic contribution reveal the genuine love and ownership he shared on Indonesia, of her development path and of her future. I have a small a gift to the Indonesia project, a small a picture of Professor Arndt while he attended the Idul Fitri celebration in the residence of uh, the ambassador of Indonesia. But can you have that? Uh, Oh yes, it's uh, it's coming, but I will give it back to uh, 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 Budi later on. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much. Happy anniversary for Indonesia Project 
Long Live Indonesia project. I thank you. Thank you so much. 